My name is Marianne Rosenberg, um, and we're obviously very, very honored to have the uh, Wasserman Show here. We view it as extremely important to make people, unfortunately, rediscover uh, this brilliant work. Uh, we're also very pleased that uh, you know our work working with Anne has been you know an absolutely fantastic uh, pleasure, and you know going through. And looking at the work and what's been done and the and the sort of evolution of his work has been fantastic. Uh, and more particularly, working with Devin has been uh, really, really lovely. And nobody I think I know uh, knows and appreciates the work more than he does, except me. Uh, <laughs> although he he knows it better, I appreciate it more. <laughs> uh, and uh, in any event, so we have this little. Discussion tonight, uh, hopefully informal, not too serious. Uh, we're divided two and two, very clearly delineated by the table. We have two painters over here. Age and gender. And <laughs> <laughs> we have two painters over here and two art historians over here, and God forbid they should mix. Uh, so we have Mary Jones and Holly Hunter here, and Close. Ben and Devin here, Ben Gifford and uh, Devin Zimmerman here. Um, and Devin has volunteered, quote unquote, to uh, sort of moderate the evening in case things get a little unruly. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and then I just want to say my own thanks both to Marianne Rosenberg for sort of hosting and kind of when we first began uh, talks about the exhibition, really proposed this wonderful idea to kind of try to put together a panel um, just to really sort of bring together people who knew Jeffrey and to give a little more voice and history, especially to his work, um, outside of my own kind of meanderings, I suppose. Um, so before we jump into informalities, and I also want to thank uh, Ann Newberg as well, who has been sort of instrumental in, in helping us get to this very point. Um, without you and Marianne, we would not all be here. It's wonderful to have all of you. Um, so I do want to start with, before we jump into informalities, with the formal proper introduction so everyone knows who everyone is. Um, so to begin with, Holly, it's right here, Hughes, is an artist who's worked in studios both on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and in Ghent in Columbia County, New York. Her most recent exhibitions include a one-person show at John Davis Gallery in Hudson, New York in July, and a group show in Naples, Florida called Live from New York in which Mary Jones, who sits seated next to her, uh, was also included. She <laughs> makes paintings, prints, and ceramics, and when possible, likes to show the pieces in salon-style format. For inspiration, she draws from her study of the decorative arts, particularly historical ceramics, heraldry, uh, the nature world, and or the natural world, and storied language of painting. She has recently left her position as a full professor at the Rhode Island School of Design after 26 years of working with a glorious, talented selection of graduate and undergraduate students. Um, often heading the painting department, Holly hired Jeffrey Wasserman as a visiting faculty member. And, <laughs> and Mary. Uh, she now selfishly guards her time out of the studio for the travel that she performs for her art. Her art. Um, Mary Jones is a painter living in New York City. She has a BFA and an MFA from the University of Colorado Boulder. Her work is included in many notable collections, and she has an upcoming show at High Noon Gallery in New York City in February. She has written interviews with artists for Bomb Magazine's online site, and currently writes reviews for artcritical.com. And then to my right, Benjamin Clifford is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Fine Arts, uh, NYU. Born in Santa Cruz, California, and a sort of fellow Californian, he received his BA in religion from Wellesleyan University and his MA from the Institute of Fine Arts. His research centers on the history of abstraction and in the past has dealt with the works of Kazmir Malevich, Barnett Newman, and Gabriela Rosco. Currently, he's writing his doctoral dissertation, which concerns New York painting in the late 70s and early 80s, and why he's been invited as well. Um, so I wanted to, now that we can move from formality and informality, is Mary and Holly, have you both sort of kind of talked to us about how you met Jeffrey and sort of what it was like to sort of meet him and be a painter in New York and work in New York in the 1980s when you first sort of came across? I don't know which one of you wants to take that. Well, well I'll, I'll start because I just confirmed with Marilla, a wonderful painter sitting on the third row left. But I think I met Jeffrey for you, definitely. But uh, it's been so long that it's 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 hard 
to remember exactly. But uh, I loved his work, uh, have been very influenced by it. Um, I curated a show and put him in it, and Holly has curated a show and put him in it. Uh, so that's a testament to our, our admiration for it. I talked to him a lot about painting. He helped me, I think he recommended me to be in the um, Bill Mains Gallery. So that's how I met him. So, um, uh, I mean, what I remember so much about him, and then I don't know if I'm jumping out of line, but I, I appreciated your interview recommendation of Sheldon Tom Heil but with Rafael Lindstein. But I would say, like, what is the essence of Jeffrey's work to me is um, speed and immediacy. And I remember him saying, I could paint with my hands tied behind my back. <laughs> and I know that he could. I think he could paint. He had to paint. He did paint. Nothing could stop him. And uh, his colors are pure and out of the tube because he can't wait to mix them. <laughs> the stencils were often torn. They were made of wax paper. Wax paper. That couldn't be fast enough. And uh, I think in terms of our conversation about what makes him relevant today, I, I think it's that hands-on immediacy. And Paul and I have been around so long, we remember when everyone tried to paint like, like their work came out of a computer. <laughs> and now there's a rejection of that, I think, towards this primal, uh, um, full-on, tactile um, approach. Holly, how did you meet Jeffrey? You know, I think it's partly a testament to the lifestyle of the 70s and 80s that I can't remember either. <laughs> I know I danced with Jeffrey a lot. <laughs> I know I got home early in the morning for all of our outings a lot. But um, no, I think I met him through Jerry Hogavimian at Virtual Garrison, which was a gallery that you know really looked like a, a defended space. I mean, it had bars and, you know, East Village was a tough neighborhood back then. I lived on Rivington between Bowery and Christie, where I still live. No one told you then that you'd be stuck staying in the same place forever. <laughs> or you would have taken a little more time to select. But anyway, I have a nice studio there, but Jeffrey's studio was much more wonderful. It was on Broadway. I remember visiting him and I remember noticing that not only does he move things with great ease within his paintings, all his furniture and all his studio equipment, everything was on wheels. And he could just move it around in this sort of balletic manner. He, he, there's a kind of lightness of being to the way he operated physically in his studio and the way he operates in his paintings that I think is incredible. There's a kind of uh, indeterminate spaciousness, like, you know, there's space, but People talk about shallow space, but then there, there's, it's very hard to pin down the quantity of space in his paintings. And then there are always occupants that reside inside those spaces in these paintings. So he had both this sort of, um, he didn't start you know, with a line the way Charlene von Heil talks about in that interview. I think he started with veils or with areas of color, with a mist or a, a flow or a, waterfall of color, you know, and, and it became a place into which he situated other things. So he had this other graphic side to him where he had his icons, his stylistic language that was like his little group of friends. They would pop up in the paintings, the little thing with the ears or the, you know, I can think of many of them and if I just shut my eyes I can see them. His little icons, his little dingbats as we used to say in the graphic design business. But, um, you know, he populate these beautiful environments. So in some ways he made paintings of ambiance, of conditions of living. And, you know, did he listened to movie music while he painted. Did he ever talk to you about why or what motivated his sort of intention to paint? Because he didn't write much no. about his work. No, I wouldn't say, you know, that, I mean, that's where the Charlene Van Heil feels extremely European. <laughs> because Jeffrey never would have spoken the way she speaks. And, but he, he, I think there was a kind of, he talked about the music and what it meant to listen to something that he could be inside of while he was trying to make a visual space that he could be inside of in the paintings. I mean, he talked about it much more like a poet, much in a very, uh, not someone who would write about a poet, but someone who would be slowly finding the right word over a great, you know, I think there's something contemplative about his practice. So even though things are made fast, 
there's a lot of time in looking. You know, it's sort of like jazz, the improvisational nature of Jeffrey's work. He had to make sure he knew the sum total of all the last acts before he made the next mark. You know, so there was a lot of looking. I mean, the painting probably, the actual time your hands touching it was short, but the time in between the marks was long. I think it's also fair to say that there was a return to the idea about beauty yeah. at the time. That, and also pouring was everywhere. Yeah. I remember Jeffrey and I spent a lot of time talking, talking about, about Laura Cohen's work. <laughs> and uh, she can't be here tonight. Uh, but I, I thought of uh, Maura Dreyer, uh, mm -hmm. who also has a similar era. Er and then, Marilla will remember the show, Arabesque. That mm -hmm. shape was, uh, yeah. you were pouring uh, at that time. I was, everyone was pouring. There was all this. Uh, and I think that Jeffrey had uh, a, a very um, mm. contemporary approach to that, that, that. And there was a lot of discussion about gender and pouring. Uh, everyone was into uh, Jacques Lacan and analyzing feminine and masculine space. And uh, so the idea of de decoration, de the decorative became an intellectual uh, and provocative um, uh, issue. Like right. a painting could be. That, that it was daring for a painting to be um, so seductive, so, so open, mm -hmm. so um, uh, uh, light in, in the sense of um, uh, theory. Uh, so people were reading paintings, I think, uh, through, through Lacan, through, through, through gender, decoration, femininity, and, uh, and, that, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of language that came from that. And Jeffrey was very buoyant in that regard, and I think there was also a, a um, rediscovery of modernism as, as, uh, as a place that was, um, uh, I, I guess, beautiful and um, almost sculptural, it, right, like um, um, for, forms, like modernist forms, like Maura Dreyer had that arabesque, that mm -hmm. shape too cut into her paintings, which mm -hmm. Came, I think, from the uh, from Cubism. It was a very popular shape from uh, Picasso. You know, very sexual motif. Yeah. So, um, well, so no, that's I, interesting. I, I think that what I find curious about what you just said is that, that at that moment there was a daringness to flirt with the decorative or to embrace these sort of tropes from modernism. Then what were, this is the transition, what were, why would that be daring? I mean, what was the stakes of painting in the 1980s that made something as embracing a, you know, a decorativeness to it, or simply a non-Lacanian based <laughs> deconstructive mode of, you know, understanding so, so possibly controversial, or at least we would look back on it and call it controversial. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, what Mary said about a kind of rediscovery of beauty and uh, the idea that it would be radical to be in a way kind of sensuous or, or seductive in a painting really kind of gets to the heart of a lot of it because, um, you know, when you look back at the, the kind of critical um, and, uh, yeah, the critical conversation, especially in New York at the end of the 70s and into the 80s, um, what you find is the medium of painting in kind of a two-part dilemma, or rather there were kind of two, two areas of pressure coming into play at the same time. And one of them, ironically, was the fact that for the first time since maybe the early 60s, with you know, uh, post-painterly abstraction, Frank Stella, Morris Lewis, and so on, for the first time since then, at the end of the 70s, painting really kind of came, what, what, could be seen, it was at the heart of uh, critical conversation. For a long time before that, through the 70s and in the late 60s, you know, what seemed to be most cutting edge, what attracted the most attention, critically, was stuff derived from you know, minimalism, conceptual art, stuff that has been described by some as kind of low calorie or uh, certainly not sensuous at all, something that privileges um, intellectual engagement and does not necessarily appeal to the senses very much, if at all. Um, and the fact that painting at the end of the at the end of the decade, the end of the 70s, was kind of coming back to a center position, both in the critical conversation and crucially in the art market, um, provoked a lot of controversy about this. And specifically, um, you can trace it to 
you know, the so-called uh, neo-expressionist impulse, the fact that Julian Schnabel in 79 has these two shows at Mary Boone Gallery that kind of explode and open up a space for a lot of other painters working in a more subjective, more sensuous, more kind of, I guess you might say dramatic mode um, to kind of come to the fore. And quickly, a lot of these works start, um, well, they start selling for a lot. There's a huge kind of market explosion around painting. And to a lot of critics and scholars who are deeply invested in conceptual art, in minimalism, in the use of photography by figures like uh, you know, Cindy Sherman and so on, the fact that A, people were painting at all was kind of offensive because they were very invested in the kind of progressive logic of avant-gardism. Once something has been supposedly kind of transcended or you know, a, a more radical statement has been proposed, you can't really go back. And indeed, to go back comes to represent something that's almost socially or politically irresponsible, something that could be linked even to you know, authoritarian politics in a rather one particularly dramatic uh, description of the situation. But the fact that it was selling uh, for these rather mostly unprecedented amounts was an added, uh, an added problem because um, you know, the idea of a kind of, kind of avant-gardist remove from the general culture was also something that was, you know, the, uh, these critics, people you know, associated with um, uh, like the journal October, um, Douglas Crimp, for example, Rosalind Krauss, you know, figures who have gone on to wield a lot of influence over the last few decades. Um, yeah, the idea that people were painting in this kind of very sensuous, very visually oriented mode, the fact that people were embracing this within the market, all this was very threatening to the paradigm that they were trying to push at the moment. And what you, what you get, to make a long story short, is a kind of very stereotyped opposition between painting on the one hand and, to put it simply, photography and, on the other. And October. And October, yeah. yeah. Theory, right. conceptual art, photography, all three of those things kind of come bec become a... Uh, a kind of single gestalt. Um, and so you get this very kind of bitter, very vituperative conversation back and forth between people who support painting and who are happy that painting is kind of back on the scene and people who see this as a profound threat. And it becomes this kind of sense of a, a battle for the soul of art, which often boils down kind of absurdly to the question of whether you use a camera or paint and canvas. Um, I mean, you have to think also about what our educations were like. Jeffrey yeah. was five years older than me, and he studied before he went to art school at Tyler, right? And then he went in London as well. Um, you know, he studied with Friedel Zubas, yeah. who Clement Greenberg wrote very beautifully about, and, you know, had a very weird relationship with, actually, quite content. I mean, he supported him, but given, you know, gave it and he took it back, oh, which Greenberg I think was kind you. of his thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we still had to talk about Greenberg all the time. Every yeah. panel, there was, you know, it, it wasn't at all not part of the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, we, we um, I think that you see English influences in Jeffrey's painting, you see color field, you see, you know, Miro, you know, Miro looks so improvisational, but took his little drawings and scaled them up exactly. I mean, it's quite startling when you actually find out how he made some of those big floaty, you know, paintings with such an incredible... But, you know, we went to school and they would say, you know, your work has no rigor. If you had an arabesque in it, yeah. you had no rigor. <laughs> you know, and we would be like rigor mortis, you know. <laughs> we, you know, it was very aggressive, the sort of, you know, negativity towards certain sets of interests yeah. for painters. So you definitely felt like it was outrageous to and fly in the face of that. Also, I think, Holly, it's hard to remember exactly, but it was sort of through even beginning with Julian Schnabel that the, and obviously Kippenberger, but there was yeah. the reemergence of the, of the dandy, mm. you know, and a lot of this was uh, nostalgia in, in a way Jeffrey in the form. Uh, <laughs> but but it, was, it, was a, it was a reaction to AIDS, really, mm. and yeah. uh, that that had been so, uh, it's just unbelievable to even recall how devastating that was, and then I think that somewhat out of that, it's hard to, for me to articulate how it was connected, but you feel it too, right? Mm -hmm. That it was, mm -hmm. that then came this, I mean, I think who made it most obvious would be McDermott and McGill, you know, that they went to the 19th century to a time before these things existed, so 
all of those things kind of came together that the artist was this um, uh, aesthete, you know, a person mm -hmm. of refinement, you know, not, not uh, you know, Carl Andre. Or and the romantic, <laughs> the romantic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where you could carve out a space for your own pursuits that no one could take away from you. Right. Uh, which I think Jeffrey really felt strongly about in, in the studio, mm -hmm. that it was something, um, you know, he created his own, you know, terrain. Yeah. And well, one of the adamantly. You, uh, one of the things you hear so much about is the distinction between the kind of public and private uh, modes of art making. And there's a whole kind of, uh, there's a whole rhetoric that associates the privacy of the studio yeah. with the idea of um, the privacy of human consciousness, in fact. Right. The idea Plastic of. Plastic automatism and all yeah, of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The idea of a kind of interior psychic space from which artistic impulses can kind of be externalized in the act of creation, which corresponds to the, the privacy of the studio, which corresponds in some ways even to the kind of enclosure of the museum environment. There, you know, um, anyway. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. And I, I also think even down to the fact that there is blank paper and raw canvas mm -hmm. evident in these. I mean, I, I, all of us have been through this because we all had it. People would, is it finished? <laughs> you know, you're like, Gorky's dead. It's been years. I mean, <laughs> what's your problem? <laughs> you know, I mean, the idea of being able to make a blank part of a painting, an active part of a painting, <laughs> it, you know, all of that was, you know, very much part of his studio practice, too. Well, so then the question that I have is, after this sort of schnabel-induced revival of painting, there was a backlash in the 1980s, uh, to a degree, or at least a discourse that sort of constantly tried to proclaim its death yeah. from its yeah. sort of oh, opponents. Oh, it died constantly. Um, <laughs> yes, it's a zombie of sorts. Um, but what I, what I find interesting, though, is Jeffrey, nevertheless, who continued to paint what would be, you know, now is we kind of sort of started, something that was almost daringly decorative or at least engagingly subjective. Uh, at a moment when painting and that sort of subjectivity was being rejected by at least the critical world, if not the art market itself, that he nevertheless found himself amongst the camp mm. of everyone else who would have been sort of taken by those critics and put in an opposite camp, whether or not it was yeah, like Coons, well, like yeah. Halley, yeah. um, and all of these other figures that he sort of managed to engage. What was it about Jeffrey that sort of well, no, you, to. We, one has to remember how small the art world mm -hmm. was then. You know, and now it's, it's huge. Then, after a certain amount of time on West Broadway, you knew everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it was really little. And you had friends from all camps, even though yeah. there were moments, you know, where well, it got tense. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was very small, and they also shared a gallery, I mean, you know, to some degree. Um, and I think... Everyone knew everyone, and everyone crossed, you know, socially through many, you know, ways of working that they could never inhabit themselves. I mean, Coons is a, a I mean, I, Jeffrey and, and Jeff are just like, it's, they're the odd couple in a way, and it's great. And they totally got along in a wonderful way. But I remember going to a studio and seeing the inflatable rabbit that was the model mm. for you know what. <laughs> Which I think is one of the great artwork. I mean, Coons is someone I have spent a humiliating amount of time defending in my life because I think he's a great artist. You know, and it doesn't mean it's my taste in art. You know, I'll take Gorky, thank you. But, you know, but I think he's a really good artist. The show that all of us remember probably so vividly was the liquor show where he cast all the different socioeconomic levels of liquor collectible containers at, in stainless and put them... That show was a show of genius. I'll never forget seeing that. I was dumbstruck. But it isn't close to my heart. <laughs> Whereas Jeffrey's paintings are. From my perspective, what I kind of have to... You know, what I have to remember coming from an art historical or critical perspective is the idea that, the, you know, the, the critical discourse, this idea of kind of battle lines drawn and so on, it, you know, it can only partially describe the realities of artistic practice, even at the best of times. And when it's this kind of very black and white, either or uh, kind of situation, I think, it, you know, it just doesn't at all, you know. And, and the fact is, is that the, the rhetoric of the moment 
uh, as well as kind of the retrospective uh, descriptions of that moment that we have, by and large, these have been transmitted to us by the very people who were there at the time enacting these kinds of critical battles and who are very invested in presenting the moment as if it was this kind of desperate, you know, uh, conceptualist vanguardism under siege from painting and vice versa. Um, and the irony for me is that, you know, when I saw that, when I read that, uh, uh, you know, Jeffrey Wasserman kind of hung out with people like Coons and, and Peter Halley, who you certainly, as you suggested, you wouldn't really readily associate with a kind of lyrical, subjective, spontaneous way of making art. The funny thing is, is that, you know, if the hostility towards painting that you get in the late 70s and early 80s is very flexible. It was able to mutate and kind of turn almost on a dime, depending on what seemed kind of most threatening that was going on in the art world. So, you know, for a while, you know, the enemy is this kind of subjective impulse and the kind of heroic artist as embodied by a, a you know, a schnabel, for example. But then as soon as that kind of dies down and the kind of neo-conceptual Halley Coons model or Ashley Bickerton, for example, as soon as that starts to kind of have its moment, you know, if Halley or, or, or Phil Taffy, for example, if they're painting, well, you know, this isn't a kind of subjective uh, you know, performance of that same kind, but it, it just, it was just as threatening. So the terms had to kind of instantly reorient themselves and you get the same kind of hostility towards their work, even though, you know, it doesn't fit into that earlier mold. Yeah, I don't know how much Jeffrey thought about Schnabel. You know, we always related, I mean, at the time, you know, we were watching Mary Boone learn to walk on her high heels yeah. and Schnabel <laughs> worked at a bar down the street. Like we, I worked at Spring Street and he worked at Rune Street Bar. You know, I mean, it was yeah. like people were not these iconic, you know, position holders that they well, are if you look back from now. They, so there was a little less, I mean, I think the, something that often enrages me at school, <laughs> I look at them because I went to RISD, um, the I'm okay, you're okay, whatever you do is okay, whatever you do, you know, everything's okay and we don't hold distinct positions. I mean, I don't mean to say artists then felt that way, which is a problem sometimes now. Perhaps we've gone too far mm -hmm. away from the battle lines being drawn. <laughs> I'd like to draw a few sometimes. But um, I do think that a lot of artists felt that there was plenty of sort of friggy diggy space for whatever anyone did among, you know, I don't think... You know, Jeffrey felt what Coons, Jeff Coons was doing was a threat. They could walk down Canal Street and buy the rabbit together. I mean, w there was no problem with that conversation. And certainly, you know, uh, you know, his work it doesn't it doesn't fit into those kinds of stereotyped categories. That if you just look at the conventional account, you would believe well, art in the early '80s it was either. Uh, you know, it was either Coons or Schnabel, for example, right? But there, you know, there were a million, there were an infinite number of other people doing stuff that doesn't conform to those kind of factionalized camps. And yeah. it's looking at that material um, that I think helps us kind of get away from the those very kind of almost politically motivated conflicts of the moment. You need to open up space so that people that don't fit into those narratives, like Jeffrey Wasserman, or for like I think of Mary Heilman, that's someone that I work on a lot. You know, yeah, she's someone who was doing crazy, amazing stuff at that moment. It's not at all, you can't describe it at all in terms of right. how you usually think about that moment. Um, so I, I think that's why work like this and seeing it like this, you know, it doesn't look like Julian Schnabel. You would never mistake it for that kind of stereotypical neo-expressionist stuff. But it, it's not, I think, someone that, that, could, that was showing at Mary Boone at the time that it would be Gary Stephan. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we uh, all they, they have about him something more. in common. So yeah. mm -hmm. not so far afield, really. Yeah, no. yeah, I mean, and, definitely in dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And I think it all comes down to, um, you know, they, you either support the work because you find it uh, worthwhile or... Not, and I think I think Jeffrey's work was was uh, recognized by his peers. Uh, what, what you know, was. and the way they talk about the way they, Charlene von Heil says painting moves. That's a phrase that really galls me. I, <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> oh, I had students who used it a lot, and I used to just get like rashes from it. And you know, I know what she means though, and I I do think that um, you know there's a lot of history in his work, and mm -hmm. he had a profound love affair with the history of painting. Yeah. But it's a, very different than the way it's described here, which is much more analytical in a way. And, you know, I think that, um, remember the show at Philippe Brie, I don't, mm -hmm. yeah. where 
I was in it too. I, I can't remember what it. We had to show something that influenced our becoming an artist. And I remember Jeffrey had a particular book that he had had as a child. You know, that where he studied our history from it. And you know, uh huh, paintings of the Louvre. Uh -huh, That's what it was. Yeah, I, I remember where it was displayed in the gallery and all of that, but I couldn't remember what it was. And you know, I think that. Um, what interested me, in a way, was the way he moved from color field to put these rather actually rude and culturally infused, you know, graphic signifiers all over everything. And in a way, in a, in a painting that, you know, while Pat Steer was off doing something else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think it's really interesting the way he took two things he cared about and kind of, you know, forced them under pressure together. I don't think that... Um, I think we're used to what he did now. Yeah. Lots of people do it, but it didn't look that familiar then, you know. Yeah, I think I mean, that for, layering and that. I, I think I mean his relationship to the past of art is something mm -hmm. that feels very contemporary to me. It feels yeah. much more like like you're saying. It feels much more typical of how people approach mm -hmm. their sources, their influences. You might say than. Um, than you know something like in the eighties. You know, mm -hmm. like that painting over by the camera with the red on the blue. Yeah. I, I can't look at that and not think of Howard Hodgkin and his, the fact mm. that he spent time in England and mm. studying you know, at the grad level when he went there. And you know, that's very, that just reeks of it to me mm. in a good way. I mean, like, you know, in a perfumed way. <laughs> <laughs> reeks of it in a really good way. I mean, I, you know, I think that's interesting. But who, what was that guy? Um, there were also these painters in the East Village, Judd Garrett. Yeah, you know, I look at that and I think of Judd Garrett now. Howard Hodgkin and Judd Garrett, you know, never the twain shall meet, but I can see both of them in this room, you know, right. which is interesting. Stephen Mueller. Oh, totally. Did you see the Stephen Mueller show? No. He's a painter that many painters thought very highly of. He died, sadly. And his work was just down in a show curated by Terry Moyer at um, the Hunter's Space, yeah. and it was a gorgeous and show. The title of the show was uh, Orchidaceous. Orchidaceous, So, and I yeah. think that that <laughs> brings in a lot of the things that we're uh -huh. talking about here, too. Right. So do you think Jeffrey ever felt the pressures or expectations of the art market, or how he kind of negotiated sort of his position amongst it in the 1980s when it was expanding so quickly? Well, I think everybody feels that pressure who, you know, has, will, or wants to sell their work. You know, it's not something you could ever fully ignore, even if you wanted to, more than life itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's always there somehow. I mean, you have to, it's, you want to show it, you want to get it, and you know, galleries would he always come had, and go in and out of business. Yeah, you I, know. he always had something going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you said something to me on the phone that I, I was struck by about something about why he didn't construct a more commercially viable persona. <laughs> I went, do you know what the 80s was like? We didn't have Facebook or Instagram. We didn't construct personas. No, you know, I, I knew exactly what you meant because, of course, he was friends with Kuhn who constructed a persona, <laughs> you know. But I understood where it was coming from, the question, but I also realized how foreign to the feeling of that time that phrase is, you know, in a, in a way that, you know, I get what you mean, but I think Jeffrey's commercial efforts had to do with making human contact, like Getzoller or mm -hmm. Collins and Malazzo or Ted Greenwald or poets or writers or people who worked with, you know, art history or, you know, any, you know, I think it was basically in that smaller art world a person-to-person -person connection making that you hoped would result in, you know, someone else seeing the work who would then do, you know, like sort of something you could chart out, like a network of connectivity. Mm. I would describe it that way. Does that sound? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, I, I, you know, I don't think he worried about it that much. I mean, he was ambitious, of course, but I mean, he was. Jeffrey was busy painting. <laughs> yeah, he was very busy painting. But I think he did worry also. I mean, you know, any galleries came and went. It was hard. You know, yeah. I think, you know, no one could be immune to that. Really. Yeah. 
Um, and then you, you know, you, they, people try to stimulate interest around things. And what we were implosionists together. Mm -hmm. We were on a panel at the clock tower that was created with a number of artists, and I wish I had a list of them because it would be humorous. But you know, we were like, well, what is implosionism? We are implosionists now. And, you know, it was Ted Greenwald and Les Levine, who was an artist, a conceptually art inclined artist, who bought a lot of painting from the East Village. In fact, Jeffrey and I both were bought by him, were you? No. Well, he gave the paintings to the Albright College galleries, and you know, we ended up going there to a big thing. You know, but I mean, it was like, wow, I was astonished that this conceptually inclined artist was buying all of our paintings yeah. from the East Village shows. Um, but I still didn't know what implosionism was. But now that I've read <laughs> Charlene Van Heil's interview, she talks about imploding as the meaning you know, bearing aspect of painting, collapsing in a certain way, not having to do that job. Like, yeah, you know, I think Jeffrey wouldn't want to have to answer for meaning in that way. So he, you know, there are things in here that are very meaty in that sense, but they were talking about a kind of space, a shallow space. She says hers are what, five inches deep. Yeah. You know, we all share a certain kind of shallow space that that's that indeterminate spaciousness thing. I did find it, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> I did find it fascinating. Ben, you sort of brought up these camps and sort oh, of yeah. terminologies and sort of art historical brackets or critical brackets that were common. And you mentioned yeah. implosionist. Uh, it was ridiculous. it was the diversity <laughs> of categories that somehow Jeffrey was tried to squeeze into. That I I mean neo surrealist, implosionist, um, postmodern abex. Postmodern abex. Yeah. Um, in all of these different categories, which I think he sort of never properly fit into, um, right. which we were but sort of discussing. He also never tried yeah. to squeeze into anything. He was sort of very, not distant, but how would you describe it? He had a certain coolness to him that was positioned his passions vis-a-vis -vis his art and other people's art at a certain remove. That, I don't know how to describe it, but it was awesome. <laughs> it was really appealing, really charming, and really um, distinct about Jeffrey, you know. He was very, yeah, I, it's, I'm not good at describing this particular quality, but it's so much a part of him. And that was what I sort of meant with regards to building a persona, is one, you know, how do they navigate these kind of brackets, both critically or historically? Do you embrace them, reject them, use them advantageously? Do you sort of navigate your artistic career around them? And it seemed like Jeffrey wanted nothing to do with them, to a degree. I don't know if that would be... Well, I don't really think he wanted nothing to do with them. I don't think he wanted to be used by them, though. You know, it's like, do you use them or do they use you? <laughs> you know, like he really was excited about Collins and Lotso and lots of the, you know, I can remember his enthusiasm over engaging with people from coming from very different points of view about his work. But I don't know if he, well, maybe none of us really know what to do with it, you know. Some people do, obviously. I mean, some people, that's really the game. Yeah. It's, you know, but I don't think that's what he was mainly thinking about. Yeah. Was, he was very, it was more about how thin the blue could get before it was <laughs> too thin. <laughs> you know, if one becomes too concerned, perhaps too responsive to the critical or historical bracketing, you kind of end up with something that uh, seems a bit uncomfortably close to, you know, an illustration of discourse or an illustration of theory, which is not... I mean, it's rarely compelling as art. You know? Well, it, it's just a different kind yeah, of work. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's it's um, you know, if you're re-photographing someone else's photograph, that's a different thing than this. You can't, you know, I suppose the distance that I was trying to describe that he maintained for his own survival, <laughs> like we all have our methods. Um, he did not maintain that kind of distance inside his own paintings from what he was doing or how he was paying attention to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That, 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 that was a very different thing. In going maybe back to the paintings themselves, um, and for those who wonder kind of why we've been mentioning Charlene von Heil so much this evening, <laughs> yeah, no, um, no. is I was really struck by a sort of 
interview that she had with the Brooklyn Rail um, about her recent show, uh, and the language regarding her painting um, spoke about it in terms that I, I think, at least very tangentially, can be related to sort of Jeffrey's work, um, which led me to kind of ponder, and I'm hoping maybe all three of you can ponder with me. You know, what struck me too as the show's gone on and people have engaged Jeffrey's paintings for the first time um, is this response that it, it all looks kind of fresh or somehow seems apropos this present moment in painting. Um, and I was wondering maybe if we could sort of speak a little bit about, you know, both what it is about Jeffrey's work that might speak to this present moment, which I read somewhat is kind of this revitalization of, or maybe a less hesitance towards presenting yourself as a somewhat subjective or re-engaging with subjectivity and emotions in painting, um, as well as sort of re-embracing in a less kind of maybe cynical manner the tenets of modernism and playing with them a little more freely. I don't know if Jeffrey spoke about this to either of you, or... I mean, I think um, it, process was very important. Just, you know, that painting was so physical, uh, and I thought the contrast with, the, um, with Charlene von Howe, that the interview was so great, that she, she's so um, articulate and she uh, is very versed in philosophy, which is, I think, reading it is almost a hobby of hers, and that language is directly in, in, her, in her work, although yes. it may be unreadable and abstract, abstracted. And I think of uh, Jeffrey coming from such an opposite place, from, uh, from the back to the front. I mean, in a way, she works from the front to the back, uh, you, you know, like, like veils of color, the, the um, responsiveness, um, music. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's, and I thought it was interesting too uh, that if she is influenced at the moment by uh, Emily Dickinson, I thought, well, what poet would um, Jeffrey choose if we had to choose one? And I don't know what would spring to anyone's mind here, but I, I thought of John Ashbery. I don't know what you think. Uh, um, Bruce and uh, Merle, who know him, but I thought like he, it, that there is this idea of having opposites together, and I remembered his um, beautiful memorial where Jeff Koons said, you know, he'll always own cadmium yellow lemon and ultramarine blue, and those are as far apart as you can get uh, in terms of vibrancy and the you know light and darkness on the palette, and you know, and then just everything that happens in between. I mean, I think it's really it's it's very dynamic and, and improvised uh, in, a, in, a, in a very individual way. Yeah, there's, I think, a kind of, well, the phrase I found reading about Zubas, yeah. who I think was extremely influential and uh, who is a very good painter. I mean, it, it's not as, how could I say, it never looked as hip or contemporary as Jeffrey's work still does, but it is very good painting. I think that um, there, how is it that they look fresh to us? That would be a good thing to sort of unpack. Like, what do we mean when we say that? Yeah. You know, is it that the colors are not sullied, that they are primary or pure from the tube? Is it the thinness of the paint that lets us never forget that it's canvas? Is it, you know, not, I mean, in the classic sense, not overworked? You know, which I think is again a really icky thing to talk. You know, it's like used as a cudgel, usually that term. You know, as is the decorative. Um, but you know, the, the, this kind of um, ability to preserve and make active blankness is really exciting to me in his work. Um, you know, he even did it when he was painting a stone wall. So <laughs> that's hard, <laughs> but he managed it. You know, each stone became like a placeholder that you could put your hand through. You know, they're very interesting. The drawings he made in France of the stone walls, because you know, there's no weight in a way at all. So I don't know the freshness factor. I think you know Charlene van Hyl's paintings have that too, but they it, they come at it from I think you're absolutely right, completely different place, and uh, yeah. And also the thing about knowing, again, it's not the overwork thing, but what does it mean, what is resolve in a painting? 
what does it mean to have a finished painting and how did he know exactly when that was? It's all very high wire act for him and his paintings, I think. Very carefully negotiated thing when it's done. And I mean, that sounds like, you know, like a complete, I mean, that's shop talk in a way, but it's, it's a huge part of the, and I'll say this in the best sense, the cheap thrills of these paintings. Mm -hmm. And they're not that cheap, but they're there. You know, they're very exciting in that way because they're coming into being at all times as you look at them because of where he stops. Mm -hmm. And that's freshness. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if everyone, I thought what Anne said, I heard you say confident. He was very confident. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. improvisation on this level is very rare. And that um, interested in your Chuck in your response via Chuck Close. There's nothing mediated between him and the, and, and the marks he made. Maybe some wax paper, yeah. but this is all you know, <laughs> mano a mano. You yeah. know, and, and uh, yeah. I think that it's rare uh, to for a painter to be so unmediated. I, I mean, I'll uh -huh. say that as someone who who struggled with that. You know, I, and, and I think he really has that kind of directness, and I think it's very, I mean, just, it's very hard to think of people uh, who have right. that, but there's not that many. Right, but I would think, you know, it's the, sort of like, not like Philip Taft, too. You know? that, that, so, oh, I, you know, oh, oh. he's an interesting painter, but it, well, that's almost an encyclopedia of sorts. It's very calculated. And, yeah. and it's interesting, I, I'm very interested, because his sources interest me, but. I think a contemporary painter who would have much more in dialogue with Jeffrey would be Patricia Tribe, you know, yeah, I agree. incredibly connected. And I don't know if she's had the pleasure of seeing his work. I don't know, you know. But I think that both the way they relate to historical painting as a, a sort of source of a kind, and and the way they make it look effortless, no matter how much has been, you know, washed off. <laughs> And I also think, uh, like Amy Silman talks about her work being uh, related very much to building, you know, mm -hmm. to, to uh, but I think that's not even true for Jeffrey. I mean, things don't really touch, they don't really align. Uh, there, there's a, uh, so I think even, even that, um, I, I think maybe even Laura Newman mm -hmm. who uh, has a freshness to her work, but there's a building there too, there's a, a literal, literal building embedded in her work and a way that things are touching, but Jeffrey is, uh, you know, they're very uniquely graphic, I think. And also fragile. I mean, there's a fragility that is at the heart of the matter with his work, I think, that is beautiful. And I would think of someone, you know, you know, if I think of, say, Franz Klein, you know, right. with those phone book drawings or something. You know, and Laura Newman, the structural quality of it is one thing, but here it's more like, you know, the, the dissolving of a memory in a Gorky, or, you know, it's, it's fragile in a way, like a thin membrane you get to see the world through that isn't going to be permanent. You know, tomorrow you'll see it differently. For me, the, the I guess the, the freshness or the presentness or the contemporaneity of the work, I, 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 doubtless it's my position as a historian that causes me to think this way, but um, for me, his kind of contemporaneity has a lot to do with his relationship to the past, ironically, and the kind of refusal to, I guess a refusal to accept the idea of closure, the idea that anything is kind of off limits because of some kind of historical, um, mm -hmm exigency or some kind of requirement of, mm. you know, continual progression. I think he's always willing to kind of go. We've talked about a lot of different artists who are kind of present in his work, um, you know, uh, from Miro to, uh, uh, you know, de Kooning was, I think, an important source for him in developing his practice to, you know, I can't help, obviously, I can't look at a kind of calligraphic drip like that without thinking in some way of Pollock, but all of this stuff kind of exists in his work not as a kind of cynical quotation or a comment on how exhausted the past has become, but as something that kind of continues to live, uh, I think. And I think that gives his work, um, I think that's an attitude towards the past that is much more, mm. is, that is contemporary, uh, much more contemporary than what, you often find in, say, the 70s or the 80s, where people were still very much dealing with, with this idea of closure, with the idea, the kind of modernist paradigm that at a certain point, such, an, such, a, such a practice, such and such a technique becomes kind of impossible to do. And that 
impulse just seems very foreign to this work to me. Yeah, he didn't. No. It wasn't there. <laughs> we didn't have it either. Yeah. Nor did she. No. <laughs> we just thought we could do what we wanted. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, you know, it's interesting because I also, I know what you mean, like references are all there, yeah. but they're not there like a checklist. And so I, I think Shirley Penhile is a great painter, don't get me wrong, but I feel the checklist. I could make it myself for each painting, uh, just about, you know, because I get it and I'm well versed in all the paint, all the painters. So, you know, I, I like it, but I, again, I'm not in love with it. I, you know, some I like more. I can always find a, the ones I like the most, but that last show that was, it was exhaustive in a way, that big jump, but... I, you know, I think they're, they're, they're really strong. They, she talks a lot about wanting to make them more intense, you know, and what could kill a painting, uh, that it, the face was face... Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. his were more like what could give birth to a painting, not what could kill... You know, she was wary of what could kill the painting. He would never have thought of it that way. It would be the opposite. You know, how did it come up or into, you know, being somehow, not... It's very, very different. One thing that I was reading, one of the texts that I think was in the exhibition catalog that, uh, that you, you all put together here, was, uh, him talking about his process and something that really struck me was, he said something along the lines of, he described how there's often a kind of specific experience or a memory or something that's like the, kind of the kernel that he then plays off against kind of formal operations in developing mm -hmm. the painting. And I was very struck by something that he said where, you know, if he felt like some aspect of either one of those kind of poles of the process had become restrictive, he would just kind of move around it. He would go to the other one and continue, or he would just drop it altogether if it was getting in his way. And it was kind of, you know, he, it, it, he wasn't so, I mean, it didn't seem at all like, you know, he, was, he wasn't concerned about, as you said, what would kill a painting. If something wasn't working, he would just kind of fluidly move around it. You know, it wasn't this kind of, existential drama about... Well, there is a lot of risk in this kind of painting. Well, you can wreck it at any given moment, but I don't think you really... I mean, if you're going to paint like Jeffrey, you can't worry too much about that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because it's going to... You know, you're going to have casualties. You're going to have some casualties. <laughs> yeah, we're... Yeah. Well, no. um, not to end on casualties, but <laughs> maybe, to, maybe on casualties. birth and rebirth, and hopefully that this sort of this wonderful first step in kind of re-bringing back Jeffrey's work to the lights of day again. And I just want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. I know as we kind of get towards December, things get busy. And thank you all for a wonderful discussion. And again, thank and, and you, thank you for your hosting. interest in painting of the late 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs>